This video introduces the method of partial fractions as a way to integrate many rational functions. Recall that a rational function is a function of the form a polynomial divided by another polynomial. Let's work out the integral of 3x plus 2 divided by x squared plus 2x minus 3. According to Wolfram Alpha, the integral evaluates to this expression involving the log of x minus 1 and the log of x plus 3. So what do x minus 1 and x plus 3 have to do with our original rational function? I challenge you to pause the video for a moment and try to figure this out. You might have noticed that the denominator x squared plus 2x minus 3 factors into x minus 1 times x plus 3. Let's look at what happens if I take two separate fractions, one with denominator x minus 1 and one with denominator x plus 3, and add them up. The common denominator of these two fractions is x minus 1 times x plus 3. So when I add these fractions together using standard algebra, I should get a fraction with common denominator x minus 1 times x plus 3. Well, my original rational function was just such a fraction, so it seems plausible that I might be able to find numbers a and b so that these two partial fractions add up to this original fraction. Let's figure out what numbers a and b might make this work. To solve for a and b, I'm going to clear the denominator by multiplying both sides of my equation by this least common denominator, x minus 1, x plus 3. When I distribute on the left side, I get x plus 3 times a plus x minus 1 times b, and on the right side, my x minus 1 and x plus 3 cancel out to give me 3x plus 2. I'll distribute the left side a little further, and I'm going to group the terms that involve x and the terms that don't involve x. If I want this equation to hold true for all values of x, then I need the coefficients of x to be the same on the left and the right. So I need a plus b to equal 3. Similarly, I need the constant term to be the same on the left and the right. So I need 3a minus b to equal 2. I now have two linear equations in the two unknowns, a and b, so I can use standard algebra to solve these equations for a and b. For example, if I add the two equations together, the b and negative b cancel out to give me 4a equals 5, and so a equals 5 fourths, and then I can substitute in this 5 fourths into either one of my equations and solve for b. So I was able to find a value of a and b that let me rewrite the original fraction as two partial fractions. Let me fill those values of a and b in here. Now to calculate the integral of my original expression, I can calculate the integral of my partial fractions instead. I'm going to split up my integrals here. Now the integral of 1 over x minus 1 is natural log of absolute value of x minus 1. You can check this by taking the derivative, or you can do a simple u substitution where u is x minus 1 to compute this integral. Similarly, the integral of 1 over x plus 3 is natural log of absolute value of x plus 3. This completes the computation of the integral using the method of partial fractions. Recall that after factoring our denominator, the key step in this process was finding numbers a and b that made this equation hold. And you might wonder, well, yeah, it worked this time, but can we always find numbers a and b that'll work like that? What if our numerator had been something different? What if our numerator had been instead something like, say, 7x minus 15? Could we have still found an a and b that worked? Well, yes, because we still would have gotten two linear equations 
in two unknowns down here, and we would have been able to solve them. We'd get different values of a and b, but we still would have been able to find a solution. Even if our numerator had just been a number, like 6, we still could have used the same method. We could have thought of this as 0x plus 6, and we could have used the same equations down here where a plus b would have to equal 0 and 3a minus b would have to equal 6. So we'd still have two equations and two unknowns to solve for. In fact, if you think about it for a while, you may be able to convince yourself that this method will always work if you have two conditions. First, the denominator factors into distinct linear factors. By a linear factor, I just mean that the factor can be written like a number times x plus another number with no x squareds or anything in it. And by distinct, I just mean that these two factors are different from each other. The second condition is that the degree of the numerator is lower than the degree of the denominator. The second condition guarantees that we'll have the same number of unknowns here, a and b, as we do coefficients here, 3 and 2, so that we'll have equations that we'll be able to solve for our unknowns. As a technical note, the distinctness of the linear factors guarantees that we won't have contradictory equations. If we have these two conditions, then we can proceed to integrate like we did in this example. In fact, this method even works if we have more than two linear factors in our denominator. We could have three or four or any number of distinct linear factors. It'll just get a little bit more complicated because we'll have more constants and more equations to solve for those constants. There are also several related methods that allow us to integrate rational functions, even if the denominator factors into linear factors that aren't necessarily distinct, or even if we can't get all the way down to linear factors and some of our factors have squares in them, or even if the degree of the numerator is too big. But I won't get into the details of those related methods in this video. You'll have to read about them in the book or wait for class or wait for a future video to find out more. In this video, we integrated a rational function by splitting up the fraction into two partial fractions.